somehow, somewhere, in spite of us, you drew us to you. And somehow, somewhere, sometime, you gave us a heart to want to know you more. And you brought us to this place. No one is in this place by accident. We know that. Your sovereignty transcends everything. And we're going to see that today as we study this character. But more than that, we're going to see what you have for us. You have so much for us that we have not even realized. Open our eyes and our hearts, Father. Teach us. You teach us. We want to know you. And you have made that available to us through your holy word. What grace. What grace. We thank you. We love you. Take my words. Do with them whatever you will. But be sure that none of us leave here without being convicted, encouraged, or challenged. We thank you. Amen. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I'm in love. I fell in love through the study of Joshua. And I even typecast the movie. <laughs> I have the cast. And I don't know whether Joshua is Tom Selleck, not really. <laughs> Mel Gibson in his day, maybe. But anyway, he was a hero. And the whole thing over the book of Joshua, the word is freedom. Everybody yell. Freedom. 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 freedom in Christ. The freedom from his promises and his words that he gives us that we don't live out. I don't. I don't. I have to be reminded continually. So I'm going to start out in Ephesians just to refresh us of what is ours in Jesus Christ. Do you know who you are in Christ? Once you know who you are in Christ, you will not struggle ever again with an identity crisis. All that other stuff just won't matter because you go back to who you are in Christ and what he has for you. And that's the problem today with our young people. They don't know who they are in Christ because somehow we have failed to pass that on to them. And I stand convicted of that. I do. And so we're going to learn who we are in Christ. You know already. But I'm going to go to Ephesians, which is called the Mount Everest of the Bible. And I would encourage you to just soak in the first two chapters of Ephesians. Just soak in it. Uh, you can't hear me? All right. Um, can't hear me. Soak in the first two chapters of Ephesians. And I'm going to read just a part of it to you. Because this is what the promised land is for us. And we just don't get it. Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Do you know you have every spiritual blessing in Christ? Every spiritual blessing. And not only that, he chose us. He chose us before the foundation of the world. We are blameless in his sight. We are blameless. We are predestined to be his children. We are adopted by him into his family. You know, if a stranger comes to my door and wants in, I probably won't let him. But if one of my children comes, my door stands wide open. And we have that in Jesus Christ, to the throne of God. He gives us his glorious grace. He's given us freely the one that he loves. We have forgiveness in him. Don't ever let me hear anybody in this room say, well, I can forgive them, but I cannot forgive myself. You know, when you say that, what you're doing you're saying that you know better than God knows. And that's blasphemy. Blasphemy. He's given us forgiveness. He's given us grace. We are in Christ and he is in us. And I love that. If you talk about a holy ground, we should all know that when we take the Lord with us wherever we go, we are holy ground. Does that just give you a chill? You don't feel very holy, do you? Or do I? <laughs> but the word of God says it to you. And as he leads us into the promised land, he is showing us what we have to take as ours that he's already given us. He gives us hope. I love this, though, and this is my prayer for all of us. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which you are called, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and his great power to do it. If we believe, he has taken us or he is taking us from wandering in the wilderness of our doubt and our fear and our anxiety and our unlove and I could go on and on and on all the stuff to stand on the brink of what he has for us and that's what I want us to do today so 
I want you to remember. I'm not putting my Bible away. I just copy it down so I can read it on my notes. <laughs> I want you to remember our lessons this year, our study this year. Do you remember what it is? I think it's very important for us to remember. It's the people of God, lessons from them back then for us here now. Don't you love that? Happy to be there. So we ask ourselves, what lessons does God have for us today, for you and me in the study of Joshua? What does he want us to learn? And I'm going to review the three goals, three goals that I put out the first day in our introduction were these. And it's kind of what Paul is saying, to grasp the vastness of God's sovereignty. Are we getting it? I think Sarah did a great job last week explaining the sovereignty of God over all. To grasp the great vastness of God's sovereignty and his unfailing love for his people. I don't know why he didn't just zap those Israelites. <laughs> but he didn't. Because he is a God of unfailing love for his people. Number two, to desire the transforming power of him in our lives. Do you want to stay the same that you are today? Or do you want to change? Do you want him to transform you into the person that he has for you to be? We have to ask him to change us. And if you ask him to change us, he will. And to seek his goal for our lives and not our own. That's the hardest thing because I can plan out my life so beautifully out there. And it's always just a mess. Don't settle for second best. It's like C.S. Lewis says, it's like a little boy playing in a mud puddle. And two miles away is the ocean and the beach. And all he knows is the mud puddle. We don't want to be stuck in the mud puddle, puddle girls. He has more for us. Now, Genesis 12, 2 tells us what this is all about. It's God's promise to Abraham. You remember, we've gone back there a million times, but it is so important. This is one of your, one of your hangers. He says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. He promised that to Abraham when he called him out. And so, after Abraham... There was Isaac. After Isaac, there was Esau and Jacob and Jacob's children. And they established the 12 tribes. And after Joseph, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, for they were put aside because they were such a stinky people. And in that being put aside, God developed them, gave them great prosperity. And you remember who brought them out? Moses. And what did he do when he brought them out? He lifted the staff and what did God do? He parted the Red Sea. They went into that land, but they got stuck in the mud puddle, and they wandered for 40 stinking years, around and around and about. And you know what they did in the 40 years? They griped, they complained, they said, where are you, God? Why haven't you done Why blah, 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 like we do? They were stuck in the mud puddle, but Joshua and Caleb were two shining stars. It just takes one or two people, though, to turn a nation around. Did you know that? That's why we've got to pray for our leaders. We've got to pray for the people. Because God can raise up his people if his people pray. Our problems, we forget, don't we? We forget to pray. We take it. We scoot through life. He says to Joshua, Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid a hand on him. So Joshua was anointed by Moses. But he was really chosen by God and God's sovereignty. And then anointed, and then he was primed to take the baton from Moses to lead the people out of the wilderness, out of the mud puddle, which was a place of bitterness and ingratitude, into God's promised land. What does that mean? What is God's promised land? What does that mean for you and me? This is a, thousands of years ago. What does it mean? Well, there's a backstory here, and we all have a backstory. Do you have a backstory of your life? Boy, I have a backstory in my life. And so the backstory here is that Joshua sent out 12 spies. Moses sent out 12 spies to check out the land that God had promised. And you remember how many came back and said, ooh, too scary. Only two came back and said, with God's help, we can go in and conquer the land. Only two did that. And so God gave Joshua a directive, and he says in Joshua 1.5, no one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. You know he says the same thing to you and me? Every day I read a scripture that says, I will never leave you or forsake you. 
He sang the very same thing to me and to you as he said to Moses, I will never leave you or forsake you. He says, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to the forefathers to give to them. When God promises it, he's going to deliver. If you can come up with one time, one promise that God has given that he hadn't delivered on, either already, or he's delivering now, or it's going to be in the future, you let me know. There's not one. And people say, oh, the Bible contradicts itself. Really? <laughs> you know who says that? The people that don't know the Bible. <laughs> exactly. But they think they do. Sad, isn't it? So, but what are we supposed to do with those people? Love them. Pray for them. Be friendly. Always. He says, be strong and courageous. I don't know if God was telling Joshua to be strong and courageous <coughs> because of the giants in the land or because of the people he was going to lead in. <laughs> I think probably both. <laughs> because they were not a pretty people. They really weren't. They had been born in the wilderness, the ones, all the ones that grumbled and complained in the wilderness died. Even Moses did not get to go into the promised land. Now, he's in heaven, don't get me wrong, but he did not get to physically go in to the land that God had promised him. Do you remember why? Does anybody remember why? He struck the rock. He struck the rock. That seems so little to you and me, but in the day, not so little. And it's not so little now. God commanded him to speak to the rock. And water would come forth, and Moses, in his exasperation, struck the rock. You can choose your sin, but you cannot choose the consequences. That's one of the hardest truths for me to swallow sometimes. So he says, be strong and courageous, but he says this. Do not let this book of law depart from your mouth. And meditate it on day and night, so that you might be careful to do it every day and night. Pretty strong, isn't it? Pretty strong. I don't know about you, but God had to get me to the nape of my neck and stick my nose in his word before I ever really even wanted to know the word of God. But I had asked him to give me a hunger and a thirst, and by God, he did. And once you start drinking of that water, you can stop. But I think you would be so unsettled in your spirit that you would have to get back. You'd have to have, I have to have the word of God. I have to have it. I have to have the living water. I have to have it. So, what do you think? When God has given us the formula for the power and the direction and the courage for our lives, why do you think we don't get it? Why do you think we struggle so? Are you fear-free? Are you anxiety-free? Are you guilt-free? Are you free of all that stuff, all that baggage that tends to weigh you down? I'm not. It's a journey. And I'm not. <coughs> and when I have one victory, I can get prepared because there's going to be another one on the horizon. But I'm going to have to walk in it, walk through it. I'm going to have to trust my God because he is the victor. We have giants in our land. The, the spies came back and said, oh, there's giants in the land. <coughs> They're probably about six to three. They were probably the people back then, so they looked like giants. Giants like we have in our lives. I want to name a few giants that I've had in my life, and still can. I mean, in a moment. Anxiety. You let someone start touching my grandkids? <laughs> Fear. You let someone start touching those things and those people I love? Fear. We live in a fearful time, girls, in what's going on in our country. And if you don't have a little anxiety and fear about that, then you're nuts. <laughs> because we're on the brink. We're on the watershed of something happening. And so what do we do with that fear and anxiety? Joshua is going to show us how to deal with the fear and anxiety. He's going to show us the pattern. <coughs> He's going to show us. How about unloved? Do you love everyone? You know, I'm convicted. I went down to Union Gospel for a beautiful dedication of a friend of mine's, uh, the chapel down there for a close friend of many of ours, Susie. And um, as I passed the homeless people walking by my car, you know what I did? I locked my doors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't think that's stupid, I don't, but I'm going, what's my motive? My motive, I cannot tell you that I'm ready to jump out of the car and grab one of those homeless men and hug them. I wish I were. And God will, if that's what he's called me to do, then he will give me what I need to do that. 
And there are others that can do it and do it beautifully. Some in this room. Unforgiveness. Can you say that you have forgiven everyone in your life, even as a little child? Remember those hateful things that were said to you as a child? Those lies? Remember those? Now, unforgiveness means, I mean, forgiveness means that you don't just forget them, but you remember them. You know, sometimes we just discard people if they cause us pain. We, and so that's a form of a unforgiveness. How about discontent? Are you always striving to get more? Well, that's in our DNA, isn't it? Always striving, always pushing, always wanting. You have to live as long as I do before you get over that. <laughs> because, you know, really and truly, there's nothing much, you know, you've seen it all, done it all, and you think, why did I accumulate all that stuff? Because nobody wants it. They really don't, you know? So anyway, uncertainty and selfishness and frozen anger. Frozen anger. Joshua's name was changed by Moses, and it's an interesting change to me. His name was Hoshea, which means salvation. And this is key to this book. It was changed to Joshua, which means Yahweh saves. And we're going to see every step that Joshua took in obedience. God is the one who did the work. Moses, I mean, Joshua was willing and used by God, but God did the work. So this is really God's book highlighting Joshua. So the backstory was Joshua grew up. I mean, Joshua was in the in the wilderness, wandering around with all those people, and he heard all of the griping, and he heard all the complaining, and he heard all of that stuff. But I have a feeling that he was different because Joshua's focus was on God and not what he didn't have or didn't have. He watched Moses. Moses was his mentor. He was a spy. He was not blind to what had happened in the wilderness. He was not blind to all the disobedience. He was not blind uh, to, to Moses' disobedience even in striking the rock. He saw it all. He saw the Red Sea parted. He saw it all. And if he had not focused on God doing it, he would have gone down. We know that. He would go down. Same with us. If we get our mind on the circumstances, we will go down. There's no question about that. He had a choice. He could judge God by his circumstances, or he could judge the circumstances in the light of God's character. I'm going to say that one more time. He could judge God by the circumstances, or he could judge the circumstances in the light of God's character. Do you know the character of God? Are you learning the character of God? Because when you, sometimes when I get up in the morning and I can't pray real fast, I start going through the character of God and it just lines me right up. Lines me right up to pray. He was a general in Moses' army. He was a man of great courage. We see that. He was a warrior, but first he was a worshiper. He worshiped God. And in that worshiping of God and knowing God, he got his strength. And here's Rahab. Love Rahab. We are all Rahab. You know that? We're all Rahab. We've all committed adultery in our hearts because we have loved other gods before our true God. But God's mercy and grace to Rahab is such a bright and shining light to me. I love her. I love her. Because she is a woman of the night. And I don't know why. Maybe she was more like some of our trafficked girls today that are out there that have no choice and they're being trafficked and sold into prostitution. I don't know. But I know God saw her heart and something in her heart and he brought her out of that despicable place. And not only did he bring her out, do you know she's only one of two women listed in Hebrews 11, which is the Hall of Faith? Do you know that she is in the lineage of Jesus Christ, which I just love? Rahab was a woman of the night, and for whatever reason, the spies ended up, two of them that were sent back in, ended up in her house. And this is why God used Rahab. She gives her testimony in about two sentences. She said, when we heard you were coming, our hearts melted, and our courage failed. But the Lord your God is the God of heaven above and on earth below. Please show me your kindness. Give me a sign that you will save my family. And a sign was given. Now, I don't know whether the scarlet red was because of the word that the sign of blood and Passover, or whether it was just a dye that was coming, it doesn't matter. 
It's interesting that in God's sovereignty, it was scarlet. Because he loves the color red. Mm -hmm. He loves it. And so the scarlet thread was to be placed in her window. They returned and they told Joshua. And they set out to go back in. And the first miracle, of course, is another parting of the water. Moses is the only one that parted the water. Moses parted the Red Sea. God parted the Red Sea through Moses. God parts the Jordan River through Joshua. Early in the morning, they set out with the ark. Now, this is key because the ark signifies what? What is the ark? We studied that last year. The presence of God. The presence of God. In the ark were the things that God told them in the mercy seat on the top of it, the tablets, the presence of God. So everywhere they went, as God directed, they would take the ark, and it would be in the middle of them. Is that kind of not a sign to us that we don't dare go into any land without the presence of God? Or if we do, it's at our own risk. The people went over after God had told Joshua to go in the middle of it and stand. The people went to cross over, but the first the priest took the ark, and as soon as the priest with the ark set foot in, the river parted. The river parted in an astonishing way. And these people saw God, God's hand, his miracle. He has power even over nature. Everything. <coughs> and Joshua, directed by God, had each leader of the 12 tribes put a stone, and you know that, after they crossed over. We read that. But you know in Deuteronomy 31, it tells us, God telling Moses that this was going to happen? Very interesting to me, because you know, he told Moses, the Lord your God will cross over ahead of you, talking about, about the Jordan River. And the truth is, what God says is going to happen is going to happen. It's just going to. And I'm telling you, he's telling us some stuff that's going to happen, girls, and we need to know it's going to happen. We can't change it by the way we think. We have to know and we have to get directions from him how to cross over or to walk through. The circumcision is interesting to me. It wasn't an Abraham, Ab Ab Abrahamic covenant. But the circumcision was to set God's people apart. Now, in your mind, and most of, a lot of you know this, in your mind, you've got to come to grips with the truth that the Jewish nation is chosen by God. And his directives to them are different than anyone else because he is setting them apart. And you say, why the Jewish nation? Why would God choose them? Because God's sovereign. He chooses who he wants to. But the beauty of the Jewish nation is that they had a revelation to carry. And we are here this morning and I have a book right there that is testament to the fact that they did exactly what they were chosen to do, and that was to preserve, to preserve the revelation of God, of himself, to the people, to his creation. Ever since the Garden of Eden, God's drawing, drawing, drawing to reclaim what is rightfully his. And we know that if we have stepped into Christ and he has stepped into us, we are rightfully his. We are his. But the Jewish nation doesn't know that yet. They don't know that yet. And God is still using them. Keep your eye on Israel. He's still using them. And so the circumcision was at that time to set them apart. But it does. It is symbolic of the circumcision that he wants for us. And that's the cutting away of the crud in our hearts. To give us a new heart. To, to help us act and live out of our new heart in a way that glorifies him. It's really important that we understand that. <coughs> After the whole nation was circumcised, and I think about this, they're in the camp, they're already over in the <coughs> promised land, but there's enemies everywhere, and they're all circumcised. Now, you think they're not vulnerable? I mean, think about it. And it says they waited about 14 days or about <coughs> waited until they were healed. <coughs> then they celebrated the Passover, and I love this, because the Passover is a passing over. We know that, the deliverance, of the Jews. We know that the, in Egypt, when Pharaoh would let them go, and this is kind of a Passover into the new land. And it's a ceremony, and the manna stopped because now God, they're going to step into what God had promised them. They're leaving the mud puddle, and they're going to go to the ocean, and they're going to find out what God has for them. Then the story, you've sung it your whole life. You know, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, 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 Jericho. Jericho was just one of many cities, but it was strategic. And it was a fierce, formidable place. 
But before, right after the Passover, before they go in, he looks up and he sees a man standing before him. Now, it's been interesting to me to listen to people and to talk and to read about this. Nobody says you can, I mean, people say you cannot identify the man. But see, I take issue with that. It's like Melchizedek, because it said he, was, he had no beginning and end. And I don't get it that that could be a person, but maybe it was, I don't care. But for this man standing in front of Joshua with his sword drawn is an encouragement to me. Because when I go into an area of battle, there's someone standing in front of me with a sword drawn, and I know it. I know it, and it's Jesus. And Joshua said, are you with us? Are you our enemy? I thought that was peculiar. He said, neither. I am a commander of the army of the Lord, and I have now come. Now, Michael is also a warrior in God's army. But when he goes on and says, I will be with you and never leave you, that is a character of God that's omnipresence. Omnipresence. So we have a visual of exactly what God <coughs> means here. If we could just see what is around us. If we could just see him with his sword in front of us. But see, he wants us to step out in faith to believe what we cannot see. Mm -hmm. There are people that say seeing is believing. That's a lie. Believing is seeing. And that's from faith. And when we develop that faith muscle in ourselves, as we are told to do, to go in and take over this land, <clears throat> then we will begin to believe what we see. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. yes. Joshua fell face down. You know, everyone that, that, that meets God or Jesus, they fall face down. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to fall on our faces. We're going to fall on our faces when we see him. And he says, what message do you have to your servant, Lord? And the commander said, take off your sandals. You are standing on holy ground. The promised land is holy ground. Now, I want to tell you this about scripture. Everything physical has a spiritual counterpart. So standing on holy ground physically with their feet planted on the earth, the dirt, we, as we begin our walk with the Lord, stand on holy ground spiritually as we begin to stand on the solid rock and to take what is rightfully ours. And so he says, take off your shoes, and he did. Now I want to go over this quickly about the pre-incarnate appearances of Christ. The Christology or Christology, however you say it, or theophany, I've read where the Christology is only about the New Testament appearances. I don't know. They're big words, so it's Jesus. <laughs> Whatever that means, you can put any words that you want to. But this is when he did it. He did it to Abraham. He came as a traveler, remember? Under the memory tree. He went, he did, appeared to Jacob. He wrestled with him all night. The schemer brought him to a place of surrender. The three young Hebrews in the fiery furnace, and Nebuchadnezzar saw four. Who do you suppose that was? To Joshua, the commander of the Lord's army. So he's telling us, he's telling us, I will come to you wherever you are. You want to wrestle with me? I'll wrestle with you. You want to scheme? I'll wrestle with you. You want to fight? I go before you with my sword. If you're in the furnace, I'm in there with you. What a precious promise. The battles, Jericho, you know the song, but the number seven is very important in the Jewish, in the Jewish history. Seven days, seven priests, seven trumpets, and by the way, I want you to understand that they, this army had nothing of their own. It was only what God provided. The trumpets were made out of a ram's horn, and they had their voices. That's all they had to go into this battle. A trumpet and their voices. Imagine that. Seven candlesticks in the tabernacle. Remember that from last year? Seven is clearly written into the life of the Hebrews, and the Sabbath is on the seventh day. God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh. Clearly speaks of God's ability to finish whatever he has started and enter into rest. What a picture for us. They marched, they shouted, and they blew the trumpets. God told them to, and the walls came down. 
Now that may not sound like much to us because we see buildings imploded, you know, in a day they plant dynamite and all that. But this was this was a huge city with huge walls, and God directed them to do, and because they obeyed God, the walls came down. And the city came open for them to go in. Now, another thing that we've got to remember as we study scripture, and we touched on the questions, there are harsh words of vengeance. God is jealous for his people, girls, and he's jealous for us. He is jealous. Now, that doesn't mean the sick jealousy that the world has. It means a jealousy that wants for you what is yours. And he wanted for his people, the Israelites, to have what he was going to give them. He wanted them to claim it. And these are harsh words of vengeance for this adulterous city. It's like Sodom and Gomorrah, and we meet this all the time. And I, who was it that said their son got hung up on this? I think that is absolutely one of the greatest hang-ups for someone coming to know and follow Christ. How could a loving God, how many times have you heard it? Where was he on 9-11? And I'm not making fun, because I've been there. I've asked those questions. And I've had to, through God's word, come to the realization of why God did these things. He tells him in verse 21, Devote the city to the Lord, destroy with the sword every living thing in it. Men, women, children, sheep, old people, cattle, and donkeys. Destroy them, wipe them out, clean the slate. All except one and her family, Rahab. You see how easy it is to be saved by God from terrible things around you, from destruction and judgment? The scarlet thread, the blood of Jesus Christ covers you, and nothing can touch you except through God's sovereignty and His will. Nothing. So, what I have again is in the lineage of Christ. And just so you know, I want to tell you, she is David's. Let's see, one, two, three. <coughs> great, 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 David, King David. So here is a prostitute in the lineage of King King David. What grace? What grace? Sin is in the camp. Someone held back, someone lied, someone thought they could hide. And I want to tell you something I, I've learned. You can't hide from God. Here's another character for you. Omniscience. He knows. He sees. You can't hide. You cannot. And you cannot keep secrets. Achan tried to keep a secret. He hid what he stole and tried to keep it a secret. But he was found out by God. God's anger burned toward him, it says. Burned toward him. And he said to Joshua, Israel has sinned, they have violated my covenant, they have stolen, and they have lied. So here's the sin of one man in the camp having an effect on the whole camp. Now I'll tell you something. The world, how am I going to put this? There are two areas of belief. There's the worldview, and there's the Christian view, or God's view. Judeo-Christian Judeo view. The world's view will tell you that everyone is born good. And the environment corrupts them. God's view says everyone is born in sin. In sin. <coughs> and God's love changes them. Okay? You've got to buy into one or the other. So they're saying here that they're sitting in the camp, one man. And I'm telling you, have you ever put in a bowl of apples one rotten one? What happens? Do the good ones make the rotten one good? They all rot. They all rot. And so the sin in the camp is Achan. He has stolen what God has gone against God's direct command to destroy and to take nothing, really, to destroy the whole city. And so you know what God says to Joshua? He says in 712, I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. There is a scripture, and I'm right now, as somebody said, yo, you say there's a scripture in the Bible. This is in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Hold sin in your heart. 
God says he will not hear your prayers. It's pretty serious, isn't it? Pretty serious. If we hold sin in our heart, God will not hear our prayers. <clears throat> so if you have something you're favorite, fervently praying for, then you ask God to show you, and you act on it. You get rid of it. You cut it out. People say, how could a loving God do this, what they did to this family? Because tribe by tribe, the men came out, and the family, <coughs> and Aiden stepped up, finally was found out. I don't know if he stepped up, but he found out. And his whole family perished with him. They were stoned to death. How can a loving God do something like that? Well, I'm telling you, friends, it is because he is a loving God. Because if he had not kept these people separate, and obedient to him, we would not have the word of God today and all of us would be lost. So in his love, his severe mercy, there's a term that I love because it helps me understand there's a severe mercy in God. If your child were running to a cliff and about to fall off and you grabbed him and broke his leg, would you be cruel and mean? That's a severe mercy. I read a book a long time ago by that title, one of my favorite books, and neither one of them were believers, and the woman died of cancer. And she and the, the husband was so distraught and everything, and he began to write to C.S. Lewis. And C.S. Lewis, in his wisdom and the way that he did things, you know, ministered to him through mail, through letters, and the guy came to know the Lord. Now, in God's sovereignty, what was God's plan? For that man to come to know the Lord. Now, I think the wife had already done that, but he was resistant to it. What if he had taken both of them when they didn't know the Lord? We know what would have happened. They would have been doomed eternally. And we studied about that last year, and it's not a good plan. You don't want to be there. <laughs> Somebody says, Oh, don't scare me. I'll scare you. <laughs> anyway, so it's grace. It's grace. And if you have cancer, and some of you have had it, and I've had it also, if it's small, medium, or large, what do you do with it? What do you do? You either cut it out, burn it out, or poison it out. And if you do not, what will it do to you? It will kill you. It will eventually kill you. The same is with God. His people were infected with a cancer in the camp. And it was Achan who disobeyed God. Now, this is before Jesus. This is before the age of grace. And we seem to get by with stuff today. You know, doesn't it seem that way sometimes? But God's, God doesn't change. He still hates sin today as much as he hated back then. But he has a purpose for these people to record, to preserve his revelation of himself. If he didn't have that, then our redemptive story would be destroyed. Although it wouldn't because Satan can't destroy it. Another miracle is the sun stood still. Don't ask me how it happened. I don't care. If God said it happened, it happened. I mean, I don't understand. I know that, I know that they went in to fight. And, and after, they, after they'd had the defeat because Joshua didn't obey or didn't pray or whatever he didn't do, after they had that defeat, and Joshua fell on his face before the Lord and what the Lord said to him, stand up. Stand up. And then he gave him victory the next time they went in to fight. And he defeated 31 kings. The first defeat didn't happen because they went in without God. The second, the, the second victory happened because they went with God before them with his sword drawn. His sword drawn. Now, a long time had passed and God had given Israel rest. And I capitalized rest and I want to tell you why. From all the enemies around him, Joshua, old and well advanced in years, brought all the people to him. There is a principle in God's word about rest. God's Sabbath rest. God rested on the Sabbath day because he had completed everything. There is a rest for the believer. And you say, my goodness gracious, when that's going to happen? It's going, to happen. it's going to happen when you learn through his word and through the Holy Spirit and your determination to walk through facing the giants in your life, looking at God with his sword drawn before you and resting in him. How many times have I prayed and prayed over something that I have 
no control over. I'm just spinning in the wind, thinking that if I say it one more time, now I know God says the prayers of a righteous man or a fervent prayer of a, a righteous man prevail. And I do think there's a fervent prayer for all of us. But I think the prayers that we pray in fear and anguish and whatever we feel, there is a time to do that and then there's a time for you to hand it to God and you rest. Because it's probably not going to change for a long time. But I do believe that there will be victory in that situation. I believe it. Because I believe he's in front of us with his sword drawn. And he is contending with the one who tries to contend with us. It's his battle, and Joshua had to learn that. So Joshua called them all to him, and he said, You yourselves have seen everything the Lord your God has done all to all these nations for your sake. And I want you to understand the Lord is the one who fought for you. Do you know when you get your mind on God fighting for you, it changes the whole dynamic. It really does. Now, you'll go back. I mean, there's no way we're human. We're pitiful at best. <laughs> but you begin to relinquish it. And when I lay my head, I tell you, I have some things in my life sometimes I think, oh, my gosh, you know, oh, <laughs> when I lay my head on the you've been there, I can tell. <laughs> when I lay my head on the pillow at night, I refuse to let those things come into my mind because the armor of God says he gives you the shield of faith to extinguish the fiery darts of Satan. Now think about a dart. If a dart hits, what does it do? It ignites. And what does it do? It consumes. So you let those worrisome thoughts, those anguishing thoughts, when you put your head on the pillow and Satan comes out with his technicolor brush, you will be consumed by fear, anxiety, and what have you. But if you put your head on the pillow, and I, I've learned to do this, I say three things. I say Psalm 4, 8, Thou only, Lord, can make me sleep in safety or dwell in safety. And I believe that. Then I say, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want it. You know, I was surprised I didn't even know it anymore by heart. I kept leaving out a line or two. I did. And I'm going, good grief, Gail. But then I go in and then I, I read it and I say that every night. And then I say the Lord's Prayer. And I fall asleep. And if I wake up in the night, I do it again. But my mind is focusing on God's power and not my problems. That's huge, girls, as we go in and take over the land that was promised us. It's huge. So, he says you will see everything that, that the Lord has done, and he has fought for you. And the truth is, the Lord your God himself will drive out the giants in your life. First, you got to name them. you got to name them, and they're huge. Some are huger than others. He will push them out before you, and you'll take possession of what God has promised you. What has he promised you, honey? What has he promised? Victory and rest. And rest. It's hard. It's hard to lay hold of that, to grab hold of that, because we live in this crazy, crazy world. And I keep going back to Noah. You know, the ark. You know where the wind and the ark was? Up. The only place he could look was up. And that's what I have to remember. And then his famous, famous, he tells them, be strong and obey God's word and hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. His famous words are 24, 14, 15, and I've had them hanging in my house, and you have to at one time or another. You know what they are? For I know the plans I have for you. He says, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And then he challenged them. And he said, God is a jealous God. He is holy and he will not forgive your rebellion and sin if you forsake him. And if you turn from him and you serve foreign gods, he will turn away. He will bring disaster on you and make an end to you after he has been so good to you. Joshua lived. Oh, no, the people said four times. Oh, no, we will serve him. We will serve him. We will serve him. We will serve him. Next week, we're going to get into how well they serve him. Okay? <laughs> and you're going to love Deborah. I love Deborah. There's not very much on Deborah. So you're going to have to really get in there and dig some stuff out. Because it's the message for us, and especially for women. You know, we kind of like that. But Deborah is a cool girl. She really, really is. And she was used by God in Israel's history as a remarkable way. So, 
Josh, we live to be 110 years old. God forbid. <laughs> he was buried in the promised land. And it's really important for us to understand this. The bones of Joseph were buried in the promised land. Joseph, believing on the promise that God had promised them, had them agree to carry his bones and bury them when they reached the promised land. Now, Joseph believed what God had told him without ever seeing it. You know, that's remarkable. That's remarkable. I love that. So, Joshua is a contrast of people. Simple. Those who believe God and those who don't. Those who know that we have been set apart to be co-heirs, that means everything Jesus has is ours. To be co-heirs with Christ and live in that light. Do you live as a co-heir with Christ? That's astonishing. To those who choose with God's help to choose faith over fear, courage over cowardice. It's scary. It's scary facing giants. I'll give you that. It's scary. And I really don't want to do it. But I don't want to stay in the mud puddle either. You know? I just don't. And those who know we're in a constant battle and we have to fight to take back what is rightfully ours. Joshua was called by God to usher in a new beginning for God's people. To be set free and to proclaim that freedom in Christ. We are told in Galatians that we are free indeed, and yet we live like slaves, bound up in the bondage of anxiety and fear and guilt and all that other stuff that goes on in our life. You know, God's people, as God's people, and someone talked about joy this morning, as God's people, when we walk into anywhere, we should be exhibiting that light that shines from within us. Not in a cocky way, I don't mean that, in an astonishing way, to look and see the people out there that are starving to death. And you know why a nation fails? Because of God's people. You can blame anybody you want to, the scripture's very clear on that. <clears throat> God's people, we've dropped the ball. We're not going to drop it anymore, are we? You know, we're going to we're going to march forward and we're going to claim this promised land that He has given us. Joshua records battles and de and defeats and sins and failure, none of which takes place in heaven. It shows how believers can say goodbye to the old life and hello to the rich inheritance that they have in Christ. It shows us how to meet head on our giants and claim what Jesus promises us, to live rich and free, choose this day, whom you will serve. Now, let me ask you this. Is it going to be an instant victory? Are we going to slay all of our giants in one fell swoop? No. Is it going to be a struggle? You think Joshua can come back bloody and, and beat up and exhausted and tired and saying, I'm through, and then the next day I'm up and at him again? Of course he would. He's a human being just like we are. But this is a physical story, and the spiritual story is Jesus Christ is our commander, and he goes before us and fights for us, and he's the one that says we can be free, and free indeed. So if we're not, what's our problem? It's called sin. What's that? Lord, go with us today. Set us free indeed. Take us from the mud pit. Help us to be dissatisfied with the mud puddle, Lord, to choose, even though it is a scary choice sometimes, to determine to walk with you into that land that you have promised us. That we eat off of the produce of the land. Your promises that you give us. That we believe them, that we tack them up everywhere if we need to. And that we fight the battle knowing that you go before us with your sword drawn. We love you.